Okay, hello everyone. This is a reshoot of class number uh, 16 that deals with externalities, okay? So let's kind of uh, briefly review what we've done up until this point. We've been looking at uh, supply and demand and we've had some things like this where here's our quantity, right? Here's our price and we've said, okay, here's demand, here's supply. Oops, let's get that from here into this, okay? And we said, okay, at this point of intersection, we have some equilibrium price and quantity, right? <clears throat> We've also said that we can have changes within these guys so that we can have, for example, an increase in demand doing something like this, right? Such that we get this new quantity and we get this new price, right? Um, or we could have a situation that looks a little different. Here's our quantity, here's our price, here's demand, here's supply, right? Well, here's our things like that. And we could have a situation where actually we have uh, a decline, say, for example, in supply or an increase in supply. It doesn't matter. Of course, this would be a decrease, right? So we have some new change here in our price and quantity. Okay. Now, what we saw uh, last time was we saw, okay, well, what happens when we have, for example, uh, changes in taxes? So we said, okay we could have some kind of situation like this. We said here's our quantity, here's our price, demand, supply, right? And we could have, I think it was say 100, and this was say one. And we were looking at say, I believe it was gasoline, if I remember correctly. And we said, oh, okay, we're gonna put a tax on this market and uh, See if I can find a red marker here. So here was our supply plus tax. Okay. And we had some new price here of say $1.25 and I think we had some quantity here. I can't remember what it was. Let's just call it 90. And this tax of course was for say 50 cents. And we said, oh, okay, look, we've got this situation here where we're at a new equilibrium. We have this deadweight loss, which we could do, for example, here like this, right? We had these distinctions here between the price that consumers paid, which was $1.25, and the price that producers received, which was $0.75. Cents. And we said, oh, okay, there's a, there's a difference here, all right? And we went through all that rigmarole. We've gone through the rigmarole of changing supply and demand like we just did. Now what we want to do, though, is we want to look at an interesting problem, and that is the problem of something called externalities. And the taxes here are somewhat related to that in that we can use these taxes to help solve some of these externality problems. But in essence, let's kind of uh, look at what we've got here. Right? So when we're looking at this problem, we have this problem of externalities. And these externalities are when we're going to see um, changes, or there's, well, this is when uh, consumers or producers are shifting benefits and or costs to non-consumers. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at an example. Let's suppose we're looking at an example of a positive externality, right? Because these externalities can be either positive 
or here your shifting benefits. Or they can be negative. Where are you shifting costs? Okay. So, like we said, let's look at a positive one first. Quantity. Demand. Supply. Price. Okay. We have some quantity here of, say, um, let's say this is the market for flu vaccinations. Okay. So we have, say, uh, 10,000 people getting a flu shot. And it has a cost here of, say, $10, right? So here's where our market is at initially right now. Okay. Now, We know that the supply curve here is a representation of costs. Okay? We know that the demand curve here is a representation of benefits. Okay? So you'll recall what we're saying here with this particular um, flu shot. This 10,000th flu shot costs $10 to make. And currently, this 10,000th flu shot generates $10 in benefits. So recall what we were looking at here in terms of our, set that guy aside, <clears throat> in terms of our supply and demand curves, remember we said, here was our quantity, here was our demand, right? Remember the height of the demand curve here tells us the marginal value, right? So remember here, this is say, this could be anything, let's just call this the gas market. Right. This uh, I don't know, two thousandth gallon of gas gives <coughs> excuse me, a uh, dollar's worth of benefit, right? The one thousandth gallon of gas gives, say, a dollar fifty worth of benefit, right? The five hundredth gallon of gas gives, say, two dollars worth of benefit, right? Remember the height of the demand curve. is the marginal benefit. Okay. Don't forget that the height of the supply curve tells us cost. So here is our quantity. Here is our price. Here is our supply. So this 2,000th gallon of gas cost, say, I'm making up a number here, say uh, $3 to make, all right? The 1,000th gallon of gas cost, say, about 50 to make, all right? The 500th gallon of gas cost, say, uh, 50 cents to make, all right? So you'll recall that when we were Let's write this out. Height of supply equals marginal cost. Okay. So <coughs> you will recall <coughs> that when we bring these two guys together, Quantity, price, 
demand supply, we have our 500 gallon of gas here, which is costing us 50 cents to make, but is actually worth $2, right? So you'll recall that we were talking about this idea of consumer and producer surplus. So recall that consumer surplus here was this difference between what consumers were willing to pay and what they actually did pay. Right? You'll recall that producer surplus this was the difference between what producers were willing to accept and what they actually did accept, the price they actually got. Right? So when we were looking at this guy here, we have our supply and demand here for our gas. Right, and this guy here was a thousand. Say buck fifty, right? And let's just assume that that's the price because we know that that is the price. So what we're saying here is that hey, this five hundredth gallon of gas, right? The consumers were willing to pay two dollars for it. They only had to pay a dollar fifty. They had, in essence, this much here in consumer surplus, right? Our producers were willing to provide that 500 gallon of gas for 50 cents, but they only but they got a dollar fifty for it. They had this much here in producer surplus, right? And you'll recall that if you're looking over here at this guy out here at the corner the end, Let's say 2,000 out here, All right? Remember we said the height of this guy, he costs $3, All right? And we said that this 2,000th gallon of gas, consumers were willing to pay a dollar for it, All right? So in essence, here was the this guy right here was representing the cost. Hey, we're taking three dollars worth of resources, right? And we're turning them into something that's worth a dollar. Doesn't make sense to make that, right? So what we saw, is that that guy over here? What we saw was that when we're looking at our supply and demand, right, we have this at a thousand. We have this at say a dollar fifty. Right? And we said, remember, consumer surplus is the difference between the price consumers are willing to pay and the price uh, they actually do pay, right? So here, this guy right here is our consumer surplus. We said producer surplus was the difference between the price the, cons the producer was willing to supply the, the good at and the price they actually got. So here's your producer surplus. Right? And we see here that at this equilibrium, several things are happening. Right? 
we know that at this equilibrium, quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. That's number one. We know that the marginal cost is equal to the marginal benefit. Remember, the height of the supply curve is marginal cost. The height of the demand curve is marginal benefit, right? So the price the consumers are willing to pay for the next unit is exactly equal to what it costs to produce the next unit. That's what we mean by that. The third thing here is that the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus is maximized. Right? There are no more additional benefits to get from trade. Because if we s go this way and we stop before we hit a thousand, right? and we saw this when we were looking at taxes, if we're here for some reason, then there's all of these consumer and producer surplus benefits that never come into existence. If for some reason we stop here, we stop at, say, whatever this guy was, say 500. Okay. If for some reason we go beyond that guy, we make over here somewhere, we make, say, 2,000. Now we have costs larger than benefits, right? In essence, we have all of this right here is basically wasted. Right? So here is, in essence, our waste taking, what did we say, uh, $3 worth of resources and turn them into something that's worth a dollar. That doesn't make any sense. Right? So we have waste if we make too much. If we don't make enough, we lose out on potential benefits. Right? Because here we're taking resources that are worth uh, 50 cents. And this guy, of course, should be down here. It shouldn't be lined up with this. Um, and these were worth uh, $2. Okay. So going back to our externality issue. Set that guy over here. We'll come all the way back to our flu shot, right? So interestingly enough, when we get a shot, not only do we get the benefits, but we can give those benefits to other people, right? So if I get the flu shot, I'm less likely to get other people sick, right? So somebody else that's next to me who does not get the flu shot is less likely to get the flu because I'm less likely to get the flu they have, in essence, received a benefit. So when we're looking at these externalities, we have this distinction between uh, market benefits and market costs and external benefits and external costs, right? So we are, in essence, here looking at private benefits, right? So when we include the total benefits, though, from the flu shot, We have something that looks like this, right? So here's our demand, and this is our total benefits. And by total benefits, we mean both these private or market benefits plus these external or social benefits. And now let's look at what's happening with this 10,000th flu shot, right? Because we said this 10,000th flu shot costs $10 to produce. He gives $10 worth of private benefits, but he's giving $15 here of total benefits. So when we look at this guy, we have total benefits here. of which this amount is private. It accrues to the people who actually get the shot. All right? And I'll do this guy over here in brown. These guys are, 
external benefits. Right? They accrue to the people who did not get the flu shot. They are getting the benefit. So let's reproduce this guy on a completely different piece of paper, kind of start all over. Here's our quantity. Here's our price. Here's our demand. Here's our supply. And remember, this is our private. We had this at 10,000 flu shots. We had this at $10. Okay. And then we have this total. Right. And remember, this is just our external plus private. When we stop here, right, we should go to here. Here is where the benefits of all of the flu shots are maximized. They're maximized right here at, say, 12000 at a cost of, say, $12. We'll just make up that number, all right? Because at this point, the sum of consumer and producer surplus is maximized. In essence, there's your producer surplus. There's your consumer surplus. That's where we should be. But because people can get these benefits without paying for them, they don't. Which is why we wind up at this point, right? At our point where we have 10,000 flu shots at a price of $10. In other words, what we're going to have here, despite the fact that this is, in essence, what we would call our social equilibrium, We actually wind up here at what we're going to call our market equilibrium. In essence, these 2,000 people free ride. And actually, there's, there's more than 2,000 free riders. Right? So these free riders are people who receive benefits without paying for them. So we have these people here receiving these benefits without paying for them, right? and we don't want that. So since they're not going to pay, we don't go to this point. We don't go to our social equilibrium. We stop here at our market equilibrium. And in essence, what that means is that, remember, this 10,000th flu shot was actually worth $15, and it only cost $10 to make there are still consumer and producer surplus benefits. There are still benefits to trade that could be realized but won't be realized because of this positive externality. Because people are getting these benefits without paying for them, they won't pay for them. Therefore, we stop here at uh, 10,000 flu shots. We don't go all the way to 12,000 flu shots. That's the positive externality. We also have negative externalities. So with a negative externality, it's the exact opposite. Here we're shifting costs to other people. Right? So let's assume we're making paper. And we're going to have, say, 1,000 reams of paper at a dollar. Right? 
So here is our market equilibrium price of a dollar. We have our market equilibrium quantity of a thousand. Okay? So here's our market equilibrium. When we're making paper, <clears throat> let's think about what it takes to make paper, right? We need pulp. We need labor. We need uh, electricity. We need um, <clears throat> machines. We need capital. <clears throat> but there's also something else that we need. Uh, clean air and clean water. Now, it's not that we need clean air and clean water to make paper, but that when we're done making paper, there's less clean air and there's less clean water. In other words, making paper produces air and water pollution. Right? So we've priced this guy, we've priced this guy, we've priced this guy, and we've priced this guy. These guys right here are priced into our dollar, right? Because remember, that's what the supply curve represents. It represents marginal cost. This guy right here represents marginal benefits, right? The firm's paying the pulp. It's paying for the labor. It's paying for the electricity. It's paying for the capital. Those factor payments are reflected in the dollar that it takes to buy the ream of paper, right? What's not reflected is the air and water pollution. And once again, it's not that you need clean air and clean water to make paper, but that when you're done making paper, there's less clean air and there's less clean water. So what we have here is a situation where these guys right here are not priced, right? And they do have value. These guys have value. Right? They're limited and they're scarce. They have value, people desire them, right? and they're limited and scarce. Therefore, they have to have a price. Right? So let's assume that we know what that price is. Let's assume that it is placing uh, costs, external costs, of 50 cents per ream. So here is our true supply curve. Right? And in essence, that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing this 50 cents. All right? So once again here, it's the same thing. We have our market supply curve, which is reflecting all of the cost paid in the market. But that's not reflecting all of the cost because there's clean air and clean water. There's, there's air pollution and water pollution that's getting pushed out, and people don't want that. There's less clean air and there's less clean water, right? Um, and that has value. We want clean air and clean water. So we have to price in this negative externality. There are, in essence, additional costs that are not being paid for by the dollar that it takes to buy the paper, right? So we had our, I'm trying to find a marker here. We had our market supply curve, and now we've got our social supply curve. And just like the social or the uh, total demand curve here represented these private and these external costs, private and external. The social supply curve here represents these external costs and these market costs, right? So let's think about what is happening here. When we're in this situation, take this guy and set him aside. There's our quantity. There's our price. Here was our demand. Here was our market supply curve. 
And we said this was a thousand. And we said this was a uh, dollar. We have this market supply, or the, the strike that. We have our uh, true supply curve here. total, or we can call it our social, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter. <clears throat> and this total reflects these market costs plus these external costs. All right. We see that this 1,000th ream of paper is worth a dollar. And it takes a dollar's worth of pulp, labor, electricity, and capital, but it also takes 50 cents worth of clean air and clean water, water pollution. Right? So once again, here's how much it's valued at. And here is the private costs and here are the external costs I'll do them in say orange here so that the total cost here is actually This guy, all right? There's your total cost, and it's way up here. Say a buck fifty, right? So let's think about what that means. Now consumers are paying a dollar fifty in private cost and external cost for something that's only worth a dollar. In other words, when we go back to our Consumer surplus, producer surplus stuff. Just like that. We are actually. That guy's no good. Set him aside. <clears throat> we want to be here. Here's our social. Here's our demand curve. This is the reflection of our marginal benefits. All right. I remember coming back to this guy. We see that they're actually should be here at say a buck twenty-five and say eight hundred. Okay. So here's where we should be. And at this point right here. The price that consumers are willing to pay for the next unit, $1.25, is exactly equal to what it costs to produce the next unit, $1.25, right? 50 cents worth of social or external costs, I should say, 75 cents worth of private costs, right? So in essence, here is our consumer surplus, here is our producer surplus, and we see that at this point they are maximized. This is in essence our social equilibrium. But thanks to the fact the cost can be shifted to other people, that means just as if the supply curve isn't here, that gets shifted down to here, right? It's just as if the market cost curve, let's move it in, with this guy right here, comes here because the firm isn't paying those costs, right? They're shifting those costs to other people, and that's when we get to this guy right here. Okay. 
And just like we saw with our consumer and producer surplus, let's see if I can find our graph here. Just like we saw here with our consumer and producer surplus, where consumers are the cost of it here for this gas was $3 to make something that was only worth a buck. It's the exact same thing here. <clears throat> here we have these additional costs, waste. Right? We're making too much of this good. Right? So it all goes back to that idea, like we said, of consumer and producer surplus, these externalities. All that we're trying to do is we want to make sure that when we were looking at this consumer and producer surplus, quantity, price, demand, supply, Remember, this was the point that maximized the sum of consumer and producer surplus, right? They couldn't get any larger. The positive externality, let's see if I can find it here. I can, okay? The positive externality says, hey, people can free ride. I'm not going to buy it. I'm not going to be here where I should be, right, 12000 at a price of, say, $12. We're going to be here, say, $10,000 right, at a price of 10 The positive externality says we don't make enough. We have a market equilibrium that's over here somewhere. The negative externality says, hey, we're shifting costs. We're making too much. 